All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, tonight we have best-selling author Brandy Morin, who is the author of Our Voice of Fire, a memoir of a warrior rising. We are so happy to have you all join us this evening and we are going to get started. My name is Dahlia, and I am a branch librarian in Comichin, what's known as Duncan, on Vancouver Island at the Cowichan Library. Comichin is home to BC's largest First Nation, the Kwitsin or Cowichan tribes. I would like to also acknowledge the Staminas, Lyaxan, Malahat, Subasset, Halalt, and Penelicate peoples. For centuries, these nations walked gently on the unceded lands where I now live and work. Verl's service area, so uh, Vancouver Island Regional Library, uh, our service area runs from Haida Gwaii in the north to Sydney North Saanich in the south. It includes the Coast Salish, Haida, Heltsuk, Kwakwakiwak, Nuchanath, and Nutsuk people that have been the stewards of the lands within our service area since time immemorial. Verl serves 53 First Nations, 27% of all First Nations in BC, and 30% of all distinct First Nation language groups in Canada. I'd also like to introduce uh, my colleague Jason Kuffler, who is a member of the communications staff and will be assisting me this evening. So thank you, Jason. And Brandy Morin is an award-winning Cree Iroquois French multimedia journalist from Treaty 6 territory in Alberta. For the last 10 years, Brandy has specialized in sharing Indigenous stories. Brandy's debut memoir, Our Voice of Fire, a memoir of a warrior rising, became a national bestseller within days of its August 2nd, 2022 release. I'd like to welcome Brandy here this evening from Edmonton, Treaty 6 Territory. Uh, we've um, I've received a number of questions that we will try and address at the end, and I would like to give Brandy a very warm virtual welcome and hand it over to you. Taniki, Tanse, hello, bonjour everybody. It's um, great to be here with you all today. Wish we could all be in person, but this is amazing how we can connect near and far um, via the internet. I am uh, going to begin by reading the prologue to my book, uh, Our Voice of Fire. And I just wanted to uh, provide a content or trigger warning that there is reference to rape and murder um, uh, in this reading. So if you need to take a step back or um, um, whatever you need to do for that, if, if you're affected by that. The prologue is called Tina. And thank you for the introduction, the wonderful introduction. Just wanted to say, I am in Treaty 6 territories, but I live outside of Edmonton in a, okay. little, in a little town called Stony Plain, uh, just west of, of Edmonton. So I stood in the driveway of my friend's place and shifted impatiently from foot to foot, blowing on my hands for warmth. Springtime in Winnipeg, doesn't exactly qualify as balmy, and that chilly morning in 2019 was no exception. I checked my phone for the hundredth time. Where were they? I'd barely slept the night last night, tossing and turning on the mattress on the floor in my friend's spare room. Morning seemed to take forever to arrive, as it always does when you're anticipating something. Finally, a white car pulled up, and I jumped in the back seat. Two men sat in the front and my heart instantly jumped into my throat as it did every time I had to ride in a stranger's car. I swallowed the fear and said a prayer. This is a job. We are a team and everything will work out, I told myself. Besides, I wasn't a helpless child anymore. I was 38 years old and working on a story with the New York Times. Here was arguably the most important media outlet in the world, looking to give attention to our people. In all my years as a journalist, our stories had barely made the headlines in Canada. This was a huge breakthrough. Finally, 
our voices will be heard, and maybe the world will start to care about the injustices happening here, I thought to myself. I took a deep breath. The man in the passenger, the man in the passenger seat turned around. He was about 10 years older than me with short, nicely groomed facial stubble and tousled dark hair. He might have been able to pass for a younger version of Clark Kent. Brandy, he said, his hand extended. So nice to finally meet you. I'm Dan and this is Aaron Vincent, our photographer. He motioned towards the driver with his other hand. Heart racing, I pushed myself forward and shook his hand. I knew who he was, of course. Dan Belisky, Oxford University graduate and renowned journalist who'd spent his early career traveling the world as a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times before returning home to Montreal to work as a Canadian correspondent exclusively for the New York Times. This is my first time in Winnipeg, actually. His voice had an unfamiliar lilt to it. Okay, I'm curious. Where is your accent from? I asked. He chuckled. Yeah, I get that a lot. You see, I've lived all over the world and speak a few languages. So French is the dom dominant accent, but there's a mix of London English and an influence from my time spent in Brussels. Pretty neat, I said with a gulp. Like he wasn't intimidating enough. But I reminded myself, I am the one who reached out to him and he is the one who said yes. A few months before, I had emailed him on a whim to ask him whether the New York Times was interested in commissioning Indigenous stories. If so, I was the person they were looking for. To my surprise, Dan answered and said they were hungry for Indigenous content. Yes, he used the word hungry. Then a couple of weeks ago, Dan emailed me. I finally have an Indigenous story to do ASAP, and I would love to work with you on it, he wrote. My pulse skipped. Oh my God, Brandy, just keep your cool. He continued, the story is this. The government, as you probably know, will soon be coming out with its long overdue report on disappeared and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I would like to write a story ahead of the report that would ideally focus on one very compelling survival narrative and talk to families of people who lost their daughters. I was familiar with the issue. It was something I'd been writing about for years as an Indigenous reporter. The vanishing and murder of our women has been ongoing since 1492, but governments and police agencies only began reluctantly documenting this crisis over the last few decades. And their motivation to respond has been practically non-existent. This, despite the fact that all across North America, Indigenous women and girls are disproportionately targeted by violence. A few years ago, the cries for justice from the families and survivors started to be heard in the mainstream. This had compelled the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls or MMIWG. The report Dan was referring to was the long overdue finding from the commissioners scheduled for release in June, 2019. I had no idea if the report's recommendations would make any difference whatsoever, but here was the New York Times wanting to cover it. Too often in this business, especially as an indigenous person, we need to fight for our stories to reach the mainstream. It's a continual push to convince editors that our stories are worthy of the spotlight. And when the rare opportunity does hit the global circuit, there's a long history of non-Indigenous reporters getting it wrong, resulting in a legacy of mistrust between the media and Indigenous communities. I was determined to do everything in my power to make sure the media got this story right. I emailed Dan back and asked how I could help. He asked me to be his fixer. To be honest, I didn't even know what that was. 
He said he wanted to connect with some of the families and wondered if I knew anyone who'd be a good subject to feature. The word subject didn't sit well with me. We, they, are people. And these are incredibly painful stories to recall. But yes, I had several ideas of who to approach. So I answered yes, and then Googled the term fixer. My heart sank as I read that a fixer is someone who helps journalists in a foreign nation navigate the culture and countryside. I was a reporter. I wanted to help write this story, not just provide an in with indigenous families. So I pushed back. And to my delight, Dan said that it might be possible for me to co-write the piece and get my name in the New York Times as a contributor. Well, all I needed was a foot in the door in order to kick it down. We decided to focus the story on the murder of Tina Fontaine, a 15-year-old First Nations girl whose tiny body had been wrapped in a duvet, weighed down with stones, and dumped in the Red River in Winnipeg in the summer of 2014. I'd watched the newsreels of a tow truck driver or a tow truck lifting her body covered by a tarp from the river. Those images had played over and over in my head for weeks. My guts churned for this child who was taken so easily and so callously. 53 year old Raymond Cormier was arrested and charged with second degree murder in her killing but was acquitted in 2018. Her murder is still unsolved. Something about Tina's young, beautiful, innocent looking face splattered across headlines shook the nation. Perhaps it was the fact that she looked like any other girl other than her brown skin. Perhaps it was the way her body was disposed of like trash. Whatever it was about this child's murder, people finally saw our women and girls as human beings, not just another dead Indian, a runaway, or a hopeless drunk on a bender. Tina's murder woke people up to the crisis. Her short, tragic life helped shift public opinion to support a national inquiry, something that Indigenous communities had been demanding for years. So Tina's story was the right one to revisit in connection to the report's final findings all these year, years later. But I knew there was always a cost to the family when reopening these wounds. I called Thelma Favel, Tina's great auntie and the person who had raised her to request an in-person interview. She informed me that she was taking a break from the media. She'd given countless interviews over the years and had endured the prodding for the sake of Tina, but each time it was draining and excruciatingly painful for her. And so often the way Tina's story was retold broke her heart. But as we spoke, I felt her soften. I knew my voice was comforting to her. The nuances are familiar in Indian country, even if our nations and cultures are deeply varied. I also sensed she understood that I actually cared and I wasn't just some robotic reporter looking to come in, take a piece of her life and push an insensitive story out. She decided that she wanted to do it, to give Tina a voice from the grave. Her words choked me up and I shuddered at the sudden vision I had of the thousands of women and girls whose souls are roaming the lands of this nation, voiceless, yet calling for justice. I thought about all of this and more from the back seat of the car as we drove two hours north to Thelma's house, just out outside of Sagin First Nation. It was a chilly, windy day. The ground was brown with barren leftovers from a cold northern winter. Thelma's home looked like a typical small, one-story res house with chipped paint on the bottom half of the siding. The yard was tidy and quiet. The winter brittle grass was long on one side of the house and surrounded a worn trampoline that seemed to release the echoes of children reaching toward the sky. Tina once played there. I prayed under my breath as I led the way up the wooden porch steps and knocked on the front door. 
The sharp wind stirred my hair and the hem of my long black cotton dress that peeked from underneath my coat. Hello, a small voice answered from within. Thelma pulled open the door and my heart sank when I saw her. She was hunched and gray. Not just her hair, but her whole countenance seemed to seep a deep gray sorrow. Tanse, hello, how are you? Thelma, it's good to meet you. I stepped inside and embraced her. I felt her energy flow into mine and mine back to her. A small flicker of hope sparked in her tired eyes. Dan and Aaron stepped inside at my prompting. Hello, Thelma. I'm sorry to meet you under such circumstances, but thank you for having us to your home, said Dan, greeting her with a two-handed handshake. She invited us into her small living room and we all fell into the big comfy beige couches. As Dan began his interview, I took in my surroundings while keeping one ear on the conversation. Almost every square inch of the room's walls were filled with framed photos of family members. Many of them were of Tina at various stages of her life, from a little girl of five or six to one of her when she was 10, then one taken not long before she died. I was sitting in the space where she once laughed, played, got into trouble, cried, and hugged her auntie Thelma, whom she called mom. I overheard Thelma telling Dan that they used to watch crime documentaries together in this room while Tina sat on the floor painting her toenails. I overheard them. Something began to shift uncomfortably in my chest, and I felt a dull heat in the pit of my stomach. Thelma was filling Dan in on some of Tina's troubled past. I knew most of it already. She had been a lost little girl, passed through the rough hands of the provincial foster and group home systems for most of her life, but she was strong of spirit and she often defied authority and ran away whenever she could. My palms were sweating and I felt as if a bonfire were roaring in my belly. What was wrong with me? And then I saw something that scared me. It was me on those walls. My small face as a child was staring out from all those photos. The same gaps in years exist in my childhood photo album because I too had been bouncing between foster care and my own home, doing my best to survive through defiance and running. I closed my eyes. I needed to keep it together. I was a professional reporter. I had no business getting emotional. When I focused again on the photos, Tina was back in the frame and that was where she would remain. She would never make more memories. My mind flashed to the image of her body in the Red River. Another memory flared in my mind alongside it. A bloody condom floating in the toilet waiting to be flushed. Drums were banging in my head now. Tina died, I survived. Tina died, I survived. I am her, she is me. I bit my lip until it almost bled and pinched my wrist to stop myself from breaking down in front of Dan, Aaron, and Thelma. No, no, no. I keep the curtains drawn all the time since Tina died, said Thelma. I can't open them because when I look out there and down the road, I can see Tina walking home. I see her coming back to me and then I realize she's not there. Tears filled her eyes and she stopped. Dan handed her some Kleenex from a box on the coffee table and she wiped her tears, blew her nose and continued gripping the dirty tissue for comfort afterwards. Everyone was silent, couldn't hold it back anymore and I allowed my own tears to break free. They flowed down my face like a slow stream, bringing some relief to the internal heat consuming my body. I'm just gonna skip ahead a couple of different paragraphs. Um, after we left, left Thelma's house, we drove to Tina's gravesite, which was less than 10 minutes away. It took us a while to find her grave, but when I saw it, 
imagining her little body buried under my feet made my knees shake. She was buried alongside her father, Eugene Fontaine, who was beaten to death in Winnipeg in 2011. I heard that Tina never got over the death of her dad. She was close to her father as I am to mine. My feet felt like they were sinking into the ground as if I were being pulled into the earth to join Tina in her grave. Again, I told myself to keep it together. I was on a job, but part of me knew this wasn't true. I wasn't just a reporter. This wasn't just a job. This was my life too. This was my story. It was our story. Some two weeks later, the feature was published in the New York Times, and yes, I did get a contributor line. I was invigorated. I still dream of one day having my own byline in the New York Times, not as a contributor, but as a sole author. Because when my name gets there, so do all my relations. The Tina Fontaines, the aunties, mothers, sisters, cousins, daughters, and friends who have never had a voice in the world. And so I press on. So that is my prologue from my book, Our Voice of Fire. Okay. Now I'm gonna get um, a little bit into sharing. Oh, thank you. I see those little hearts and clappy hands. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I like when I'm sharing uh, my story with various audiences, I like to propose some questions for them so that they can um, do some internal dialogue with themselves to see how they can relate and reflect uh, through my story in their own lives. So I start um, with this question, this first question. And this question, I encourage you to write, write down if you have a pen by you or if you have notes um, near your phone, in your phone, the notes app. The question sounds really simple, but it can get uh, pretty um, deep. It's who are you? In three words, describe yourself in three words, but they have to be positive. They cannot be negative. And, and these questions are kind of gonna come together at the end. Um, for myself, I'm relentless, affectionate, and authentic. This is another question, follow-up question, really quick here. What do you love to do? No barriers whatsoever. What do you love to do? That's the second question. For me, I love connecting with people, storytelling, and traveling. So, Growing up for me um, was constant chaos and turmoil at home. So I was raised in and around Parkland County, which is just outside of Edmonton, Alberta. My mother uh, is Cree Métis and my dad is French. My mother got together with my dad at a young age. She was on her own at 13 years old, had a lot of different traumas that she had been dealing with. My cookum, uh, my mother's mother, was a uh, residential school survivor, a survivor of the violence of colonization and all of those different impacts um, to our family line. There was constant fighting hitting, name calling, a lot of different verbal abuse uh, going on in the home. And my mother really 
struggled. She had a lot of anger and rage because my father was an alcoholic. A lot of the times he would take off um, and she'd be left alone with four kids on her own or trying to chase him down. And their relationship was um, very volatile. So they would also um, be uh, physically and verbally abusive to each other. And it was just in this, in this constant state of, of chaos. Despite this being the natural environment that we had, we did have a knowing of a deep love for one another and being deeply connected as family. And to this day, I'm baffled to understand how that like exists, how that is able to survive and thrive. But I find that it's, you know, a, a theme through many families that have experienced trauma that there still is those deep bonds um, that have. So we were very still deeply bonded. Uh, so how I responded was I acted out. Um, my siblings would, you know, go and run and hide or, um, you know, try to avoid what was happening. I would um, respond to it by, you know, um, seeking attention or having temper tantrums. My mom was overwhelmed and decided to um, place me with a couple of uh, families within a church that we attended as, as a kid. And um, eventually decided to put me into the foster care system. So at the time she said, you know, that she couldn't handle me. And back then there wasn't really, I mean, I don't really know how much it's changed, but um, there wasn't a lot of resources that were given um, to families that were maybe in crisis or that needed help. Um, so that started for me the next, um, you know, until I was 18. Uh, living in and out of foster homes, between home and foster homes. And I would try to make it work at home, go home for, you know, um, uh, little amounts of time only for things to continue uh, spiraling. And I eventually graduated to uh, the group homes, which is where they sent the older kids, the kids that maybe weren't fitting well, you know, into the foster uh, homes. And I um, had come from a rural area. And so they had mostly kept me in the foster homes in uh, outside of the city. But when I started getting into the group homes, then I started getting put into the city. And I, um, you know, I wasn't used to the going ons of the city. And so when I started uh, living in these group homes, I was around other kids from um, all different backgrounds and areas, but a lot of these kids are what we called streets, you know, street smart. You know, they had um, been exposed to um, a lot of things, you know, uh, on the streets of Edmonton. And um, I was still pretty naive to that, even though I had been exposed to a lot of different trauma. But we were this, you know, this lost young group of kids and we bonded with each other. Um, you know, there wasn't really a whole lot of other opportunities to connect uh, well in these institutions. So we bonded with each other. We looked up to each other. Uh, when I was 12, um, I decided to run away from one of the group homes that I was at in Edmonton one night. It was a cold, um, I think around January or February, cold night. Um, we had been outside smoking cigarettes. We had earned the privilege to go and do that. <laughs> and um, I was with two other girls. They were a couple of years older than me. At that time, that's a big deal when they, you know, they're very influential, real. And one of the girls named Shannon, you know, said, let's, let's take off. And it sounded like a really good idea. The plan was very spontaneous and we were gonna go runaway it was called AWOL at the time and find some booze and get drunk and just let loose we wanted to escape the, the you know the, the concrete walls of um you know this institution that we had been living in and the coldness of the staff and the routine of everything 
And the other girl that was with us was named Rose. And so we decided, okay, let's do it right then and there. And we took off galloping into the night. And I could, you know, see my, my breath in the air as I ran and felt that cold, crisp air. And it felt like freedom. It felt like excitement. Shannon and Rose knew where we were going. I didn't, I was just kind of following them. We got to downtown Edmonton after running for maybe about 20 or so minutes. And I remember getting close to um, the Fairmont Hotel McDonald. And this was the fanciest hotel in Edmonton. I knew that all the rock stars went and stayed there and all the, you know, the famous people when they came to town and there was limousines and connoisseurs you know, outside. And, and I thought that's where we were going. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, this is so fancy. These people know some, some really cool people. Well, they took me to an apartment right next to the Fairmont Hotel McDonald. And we were, you know, excited to find this party. We get up there and there was two men in this apartment, two older men, and it was a sparsely furnished apartment. Um, you know, they were smoking. There was, you know, I remember this, the smoke crawling through the room, you know, kind of like a snake. And I, I just sensed something was off when we went there, but I just decided to go with it. I trusted my friends and I looked up to them. One of the men, um, came up to us and offered us cigarettes. So Shannon knew them. They were parent friends of hers. Started to smoke cigarettes. And uh, again, I was wondering, okay, where's the party at? And that man who had offered us cigarettes, he, he asked me to go into a bedroom with him. And just not, not really thinking and being spontaneous, I agreed to go in the bedroom walk in the bedroom with it. And I like, like, it, like it was normal for a 12 year old to walk into a bedroom, you know, with a grown man. And he ripped away my virginity. I remember calling for help to Shannon and Rose and no one came. When he was finished and left the room, I was in shock. Um, I was shaking, I was sobbing. I went to the bathroom and I, I heard laughter coming from the living room and I couldn't figure out why. Why didn't they come when I, you know, when I called them for help and, you know, what was going on? And I went into this bathroom and I, I was stunned and, I was fearful, but I had to just get myself together. I kind of just went into a survival mode. I, I seen this bloody condom floating in the toilet. And it was what he had discarded. And I, at that moment, I decided that that, that condom was me and that I was used in garbage. And I flushed it down the toilet. And I had to splash some water on my face, get myself together and go out into the living room. They were smoking and laughing and drinking beer. Over the next week or so, uh, I was held there against my will and uh, raped again by another man moved to another uh, place. I ended up... Um, being able to escape, I think it was miraculously because I said a prayer and, um, you know, I uh, had been in this room and it was dark and I, and I said a prayer for help and got the courage to look down the hall to see a bedroom door open with the telephone and called my cook and my grandmother, who I was very close to. I asked her if, if I could come over and she said, of course I could. I was always welcome there. I didn't tell her what was going on. Um, but again, that, that gave me uh, encouragement 
And I somehow convinced these men to let me go. And I basically told them that I was going to come back, that I loved being there, that I just had to go see my, my grandmother, my cook, and that I would be back. So they agreed to, um, one of the men agreed to drive me. It was the middle of the night again. I remember that drive being absolutely terrifying. I mean, I'm 12 years old. I've been through trauma. Our imaginations, you know, can run wild at that age. Or um, I remember being in, in and not knowing whether he was really driving me to my grandmother's or where, whether he was going to take me and kill me somewhere. And on the way, he, he was showing me this collection of a number of different knives that he had in his vehicle and implying to me that if I didn't come back, that that was going to be my fate, and I was terrified. I remember when we pulled up, I got out of the car and ran as fast as I could uh, inside to my cookum's house and um, locked the door and just caught my breath for a couple of minutes. And um, I felt comforted by the smells of my cookum's house, the sounds of her voice, slept with her that night, even though it was shaking with nightmares. I had to go back to the group home a couple of days later. I hadn't told anybody what had happened to me. They knew that I had run away, uh, but I, I was filled with a lot of shame and um, still in shock. I mean, nowadays it's more common for people to talk about rape or sexual assault. Back then it wasn't as openly done. Um, I went back to this group home and I was punished. So I, had, I was punished for having run away and uh, had to be, you know, confined to my room for about a week. And I got the courage to share what had happened with me with one of the workers there that I felt that I was, you know, had had a bit of a connection with. And I, it was a lot for me to go and do this to to go and and um, I, you know, work up. The, uh, the confidence to share this with her. And I, I was in her office and uh, sat down and I, I remember saying to her, you know, I was hurt, I was raped. And she looked up from her desk and she said, well, you know, Brandy, that's what happens when you run away. Don't do it again. And so again, I decided as a 12 year old, that that was the truth. I took that on, that it was my fault. And um, I buried it. But when I buried what had happened, what replaced that was an inferno, a rage that started to erupt like never before. I ended up uh, going from group home to group home, spent a little bit of time in uh, Juvenile Center became a, um, a single mother by the time I was 18 and a single mother of three by the time I was 24. You know, one thing that I really want to point out about this, that even though I had been, you know, back and forth between all of these foster homes and group homes, my family and I were still bonded. We never gave up. We still had that love. We still saw each other. And another thing is I was always a dreamer ever since I was a young child. It was an outlet. It was an escape for me. So if things were crazy at home or other places, I would dream up these wild scenarios of what I was gonna do one day. And this gave me hope. This gave me, um, you know, something to uh, believe for. Um, I ended up, you know, really struggling through my 20s with, with being a single mother, um, you know, going through a lot of um, um, a different emotional turmoil and having a breakdown when I was 29. Um, I uh, I had a, a certain breakdown um, 
around 29 that I happened to be hospitalized for. And, and there's more details in my book, but I was really, really searching at that time about what I wanted to do with my life. What was I here for? I did a lot of praying and I was just soul searching. One day, this random thought popped into my head. It was a random thought, but it was a very specific. This thought said, put together your resume, a cover letter, and a few examples of your writing and take it in to the Stony Plain Reporter, Spruce Grove Examiner. So at that time, that was my home community newspapers and their distribution was 50,000. So for me, that's a huge deal. I had only had a professional writing gig for a short time in my early 20s. So this was very intimidating, this thought that had come out of nowhere. Within a week, I decided, well, I don't really have anything to lose. So I got dressed up, put that portfolio together, went straight to the office. This was around 2010, 2011. Met with the editor there, showed him uh, my writing and tell him, told him that this is what I would wanted to do. And I said, by the way, do you, do you happen to have any, you know, any opportunities available? And he said, you know, your timing happens to be impeccable because we have a full-time staff writer position opening right now. And at that moment, I was stunned because of the thought that had come to me when I prayed. And I knew that it was for me. I had to work for it. They hired me on a freelance basis for two weeks and I, I did work for them. I had to officially apply. I was up against people with journalism degrees and years of experience, but I wanted it so bad. And I prayed and I worked. I was given that opportunity and I hit the ground running. The second question that I have for you is, uh, what are you here for? Do you know what you're on this earth for? That's the burning question that all of us want to know. For me, um, I'm here to usher in justice, but usher, I'm here to usher in justice by way of storytelling. It's not injustice, I'm ushering it in. <laughs> um, so from there, I mean, door after door started opening and 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 that um, you know, those that inferno of of like rage started to be replaced with a fire, like with a passion. Uh, for this new work that I was doing because I started to specialize in telling indigenous stories when I when I seen the discrepancies between how our stories were covered in the media and how they were racist and discriminatory and how they um, how that did more harm uh, to uh, all of the crises that our people were living in. And so I was on this parallel healing journey as well as this journey of uh, you know, storytelling. So I went to work with the AP10 National News and then I was with the CBC Indigenous Unit and then freelancing. And um, now, you know, working for some of the ba biggest media outlets in the world. You know, I've done, you know, work with National Ge Geographic. I've done work with The Guardian. I just had my first um, feature published with Rolling Stone. Um, and every, you know, major Canadian outlet that you can think of. I do print documentary podcast. Uh, I'm doing some uh, documentary filmmaking and the opportunities are um, limitless. So um, even though I had all of these different breakthroughs, Healing did not happen overnight for me. Healing was a process. It was a process that I had to discover as I went. And it, it involved therapy. It involved, um, you know, uh, uprooting a lot of this past, uh, you know, reconnecting to who I am. Prayer. So, there is this really special story that I wanted to share with you because it is, um, it is, it relates to this, this healing journey. 
So uh, in the summer of 2021, I um, had been covering a story uh, of uh, the Lakota nation. So they were repatriating some of their children that had died uh, after they had been stolen um, and sent to Carlisle, Pennsylvania to attend an Indian boarding school there. And after decades and decades and decades, the nation won uh, the right to have their the remains of the children uh, sent back to them. So I was covering that and we went on this caravan from Carlisle all the way to the Rosebud Sioux Nation in South Dakota, where they were welcomed by thousands of people along the way in different communities. It was very uh, inspiring and heavy and um, like the most beautiful uh, impactful uh, wake and burial ceremonies that I've ever witnessed. I had the opportunity to uh, go horseback riding at a ranch there. And it was a dream come true. Um, my friend who's a photographer had set it up and this ranch was a ranch where they, um, they help, you know, troubled youth or offenders or people you know, experiencing different traumas. And these are formerly abused horses and they work together, um, you know, to heal. When we went there, I thought, yeah, we're just going for a horseback ride. <laughs> so we get there and um, we met our uh, our guide and he's the head of the program, Gray, Gray, Greg Gray Cloud. He said to me, do you wanna do a spirit connecting ceremony with the horses? And I said, okay, I didn't know what it entailed. And it kind of freaked me out a little bit because it sounded really like personal, but I agreed. I didn't know really what was gonna happen. So we went into this, um, into this round like pen and Greg explained to me what was gonna happen, that I was gonna stand in the middle of this round pen and that the horses were going to come in and I would just need to follow them with my body and just trust the process and breathe. So a couple of ranch hands, they brought in about seven horses and they had them run twice around me in one direction and then twice around me in the other direction. And I was standing there taking it all in and I was nervous. I mean, they're, they're, the power of, you know, I, I felt their power through every cell in my body and their, their hooves pounding the earth and their, you know, it was, it was incredible, but I was a little bit afraid and intimidated. But I told myself, trust the process, trust the process, trust the process. So they stopped. And after a couple of minutes, one of the horses broke away from the crowd. And Greg said to me, that's Sox, former rodeo horse. He was a chestnut color uh, horse with four white marking, four mar marks on his feet. They looked like socks. <laughs> and um, he said, yeah, he's a former rodeo horse that was uh, tied up and abused by his former owners. And Socks looked up at me and started coming more closer to me. He said, Socks, he usually chooses leaders, but they don't know that they're leaders yet. And I felt something like, catch in my throat. I knew that I was going to break. <laughs> I was going to break down. He says, you know, when he gets out of the boundaries of these fences and when he gets out into the field and when he realizes that he's free, that's a sight to see. And I started bawling. 
because I knew that that was me, that I was a leader, that I necessarily didn't know it, that all I had to do was step outside the boundaries of these fences of fear that I had built up. And so that was a very impactful, very powerful moment for me. Um, you know, we, people ask me, why did I want to share my story? Um, first off, because I am in a position as a journalist that has influence. And so I feel responsible in that way to share my truth. People share their stories with me all the time. And some of their stories are just, um, you know, their most um, intimate or sor sorrowful um, stories. And they are, you know, give those gifts to the world in, in order for us to you know, share these with each other to help understand each other and hopefully to help bring about uh, justice. And I wanted to, I want to live a truthful life. That's why I decided to share my story. I was asked a few months ago in the fall, in an interview, if I thought the Canadian government um, was doing a good job when it comes to the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And I had to give them a failing grade. From what I experience and what I work in every day, the rates are as high as they've ever been. And I wouldn't be surprised if the rates have gone up in regards to this violence against our women and girls. The majority of the victims of this crisis have been inside of the child welfare system. These stats continue to spiral out of control and it comes down to so many different layers that we need to address as a nation because this is all uh, you know, intergenerational um, impacts, such as um, we have to address the uh, problem of racism in this country. We have to address the lack of basic needs in many of our communities, such as housing and education, clean drinking water, the intergenerational trauma alone from colonization, from uh, residential schools, from the 60s scoop, all of these impacts, um, our people have not really had the opportunity to uh, be healing. And so a lot of times our women are in uh, more vulnerable uh, places to be, you know, when they are targeted for this violence. Not only do we have to, you know, hold our governments accountable, we have to you know, um, the, uh, the media coverage, even I'm a journalist and I try to push as much as I can with this, but the media coverage is still um, few and far between considering that this was named a genocide. We have a current genocide happening. And it just seems like, um, nobody really bats an eye and that we have this day of awareness, this red dress day once a year or on Valentine's day, people raise awareness and it comes and goes. And meanwhile, our women are just being taken out. When you think of it, even um, in Winnipeg, for indigenous women taken out with, you know, within uh, less than just a few months of each other and then dumped in the dumps outside of Winnipeg, another indigenous woman's body being found um, in one of the landfills there a few weeks ago. Another body they have yet to identify whether she's indigenous, but highly suspect she is, was found um, on the banks of the Red River. This is all just within 
a certain amount of time. This this crisis is just out of out of hand, out of control. But there, um, you know, there is hope. There is um, people, allies, organizations that are doing what they can to get involved and to raise awareness. They we have, you know. Um, we have the truth and reconciliation calls to action. We have um, calls for justice with the National Inquiry. There are a lot of different tools and resources that people can take and implement within their own communities. They can advocate. They can push uh, their, uh, you know, their own um, elected leaders, as well as just start within their own communities start to um, see where they can help, start to get to know their neighbors to make uh, this a, a safer, better place, um, you know, for all, for all um, of our children and grandchildren going forward. So that is um, the conclusion of my talk. And I'd love to take questions, answers, comments, anything like that if you're uh, thinking of writing a book thank you i had more questions i <laughs> i had more questions i wanted to ask you guys and i skipped over them but um the, yeah the, the one was the, the the most recent one is you have to have a why that's why i'm so you know successful in doing what i'm doing and all of the different you know, um, opportunities have opened up because I have a focus and I have a why, um, you know, for doing what I'm doing. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Brandy. Um, I just want to um, say a few things before we get to the questions. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Thank you again. Um, I want to encourage everyone to engage in self-care. So should you need to reach out, um, the uh, Kuis, uh crisis line, uh, all of these are available 24-7. It's 1-800-588-8717, and that's across BC. Mm -hmm. um, the MM IWG crisis line is 1-844-413-6649 and more support is also available from the Canadian Sexual Assault Centers at 604-876-2622 or info at casac.ca. And um, yeah, so uh, if you do need to reach out, um, please do. Uh, we will uh, take some questions. I do have some questions that some registrants have already sent in, so we might start with uh, a few of those. Um, so the first question here is, how did you know when you were finished writing all you wanted to say in your book? How did I know? Um, yeah. You know, I kind of like did it kind of chronologically, um, but I knew that it was just a part one. There's a sequel. <laughs> okay. So I don't think I said that I wanted to, you know, everything that I wanted to say, but, yeah. um, you know, I had written up until that point in my life, um, what I, you know, what I had come through what I had overcome and um, what I had learned. Um, you know, and I, I just uh, left it at that, but there's a lot more um, to come. <laughs> okay. Uh, this person is wondering if the media is becoming less racist towards Indigenous people. Is it more positive and representative in your opinion? Mm. I mean, I think it's getting better. The awareness is getting out there. We still do have a long way to go, but it's really gotten better since I, you know, first started out been doing this for like 13 or so years full time. And it was pretty atrocious back then. So I think the help of the, like with the influence of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and different things, 
um, that that's helped a lot to, uh, you know, shift um, that the way, you know, that media approach things they, you know, are trying to learn. And I think it's getting better. We still got to, you know, a ways to go. I think we, our communities need to be covered more than they are and more in depth than they are. So I think a lot can get lost uh, in the style of the way uh, mainstream news is done. So it's like you go in, you get your story, you get your quotes, you, you know, you have the basic facts and that's it. But I think what's missing a lot with Indigenous stories is the context behind a lot of things because without context in certain things, um, people can make assumptions or, um, you know, things can be interpreted uh, differently. And so I really think that it's crucial for, especially when you think about it, because we're so separated. So you have this mainstream and then you have like uh, our people that are often segregated, right? Like we have our own communities and nations, but a lot of times you are in a totally different culture. Um, and so it is like you're transversing something totally no for outsiders. So I really think that uh, media needs to really uh, improve on um, investing so that people can have that time to be able to provide a lot of that context and they would need to learn and be connected to and educated with uh, the native communities. Great. Um, words of advice for young indigenous journalists that are just starting out? Um, yeah, that's amazing. We need you. We need more of us. Um, I would say get out there and expose yourself to all of the different genres of writing that you can. And from there, decide if you want to focus on a certain topic or area, like I specialize specifically on Indigenous stories. Um, but I, I think that for new up and comings, they should get, at, you know, they should get well versed in, you know, politics, in arts and culture, in human interest, um, environment, and um, really try to find your niche from there. But, um, you know, just be open minded and enthusiastic in what you do. And, uh, you know, it'll, uh, the people that you interview and meet will respond to that, as well as the editors and the people that you work with will respond to that. They'll be able to sense whether you're authentic or not, and if you're eager, and if you want to be doing what you're doing. And so if you let that, um, don't be afraid to let that enthusiasm show. Awesome. Uh one other person is uh, wondering, how do you find your strength? <laughs> um, you know, I just, I come from a strong family and I pray a lot. I have uh, mentors and people that I talk to, um, elders, and I, I find my strength in just believing in what I do and believing that, you know, it's important and, you know, it's not always easy. I mean, there's many times when I've been on a job um, and I've been completely broken. When I went to Rome last year uh, with survivors and delegates, um, when they met with the Pope, the, the survivors of the residential schools. Um, I had prepared for it for several months. I had been covering the stories of residential school survivors for years. I thought I was ready. But when I got off the plane there in Rome, as soon as I got off the plane, I was hit with this storm of heaviness. And it stayed with me most of the week. And, and it was really difficult. I experienced um, a lot of the um, emotions 
that people were going through. I felt like I was carrying the stories of all of the people and the generations before me and my cookum. And on one of the nights I went back to the hotel and collapsed on my bathroom floor and cried for hours and hours. Um, there's times like that. What gave me strength is, you know, I, I got myself together and I thought of the survivors. I thought of the people whose stories that I was there to tell. And I just got my strength from thinking this is about them, right? This is, you know, to take the, the focus off of me because I could very much get lost by all of the impacts. I'm very impacted. There, there is, you know, that, that trauma. We're human beings. How could you not be impacted when you're going to cover, uh, you know, murders or various trauma? Um, cert, you know, cert, just a few months ago on the ground searching for, for a body with a family who was trying to look for their daughter. Um, you know, scouring the the countries, you know, in a standing, looking through the bush to find their daughter and things. These are really, really difficult, but I just believe that what I'm doing is justice work. And so I I keep on in, in the hopes that some change will come. All right, we've got some questions from attendees. Uh, the first one here, uh, uh, thanks. Thank you for sharing your powerful and courageous story. Uh, what resources, I think they're wondering what resources um, do you seek to, to nourish yourself? Or, or what resources would you seek to nourish yourself? You know what, what I have to be really careful, like what I've learned, because a lot of the times when I'm like on the road, on a story, um, I have to learn to think of it holistically because when I'm on the road, I have to take care of myself because it's very easy to eat like crap when you're on the road. It's very easy to not get enough sleep or exercise. And all of these things are just as important to my overall health, emotional, spiritual health. And so I've really had to learn to exercise when I'm on the road, to fit it in, to eat as healthy as I can, because that's going to affect how I'm feeling. It's going to affect my spirit. It's going to affect my mind. Um, and, and to make sure that I'm getting enough sleep, to getting good sleep. Um, you know, it's it's not a good scene when I'm out there and you're in such a hurry and you're running to fast food joints and you know working 16 18 hour days on the road not getting enough sleep you you can you know it doesn't take very long for me to crash from that so i have to be very con you know conscious of incorporating um like holistic health and and prayer meditating um that that's what helps me amazing so important. Um, so uh, next question is, who are your favorite Indigenous authors? Um, I like Tanya Talaga, <laughs> um, Eden Robinson. Uh, gosh, there's, there's, there's uh, Jesse, uh, What's Jesse's last name? Above the Ashes. Do you know Jesse? You know Whistle, um, Thistle? Thistle, yes. Those are a few. Cool. All right. Uh, how do you keep anger at bay? I kind of utilize it. So, um, you know, I, I get angry about, you know, different things like injustices. And so I try to like channel that in a good way into the work that I do. So just motivating me to go after these stories, to get these stories, you know, out there um, and to work, you know, to work harder or, you know, exercise again, praying, but, but a lot of the times when it relates to my work, I will channel it to, you know, to help motivate me.
All right. Um, this one is um, about Indigenous men. This person's wondering, um, should Indigenous men be included in our concern for missing and murdered, as there are also many of them? How can we include them without diminishing the importance of women and girls? Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, there is also um, a crisis of um, Indigenous um, men and boys that are being targeted um, for violence as well. Um, I think that that is being brought to the consciousness of this movement for justice um, more and more. And I think that it is, you know, it's just as important um, to create that awareness and to try to eradicate, you know, this, uh, you know, this violence. All right. Uh, thank you for your bravery and willingness to share your story. In your opinion, what do you feel is the most effective way to spread awareness on an in an ongoing way as a public sector worker, aside from the usual buttons and honorary days, ongoing as an everyday and accurate to honoring yours and other women's experiences. Well, thank you. Um, you know, an elder and residential school survivor, uh, and also he's a lawyer who helped run write the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous uh, Peoples, amazing man. His name is Dr. Wilton Littlechild. And um, he once told me that, um, you know, this is in regards to reconciliation, but it can be implied to this crisis of missing and murdered as well. We have the cause for justice. And you know, if, if, if you go through and find those calls for justice, they can be found online through the final report from the National Inquiry, whereas this can be done with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. If you go and look through these um, calls for justice, if you read through them, I'm sure that you're gonna be able to find one or two of them that you can actually um, implement into your life and into your community. And even if you only do one or two, because if they seem all very overwhelming, yes, but if you can find a couple that would pertain to you, then that is a start and that's a really good start. So I recommend going to read these calls for justice and going from there. Cool. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the um, publication process for the book? Like what was there like, multiple iterations or how did that come about? Um, oh, so it's funny. <laughs> it's a little bit funny the story, but um, so for a few years, my oh. former boss, my former news director at APTN National News, and like she became like my mentor after we both like, she doesn't work there anymore and I don't, but um, her name's Karen Pugliese. And so she would tell me every now and then, when we would talk, she'd be like, oh yeah, you, you got to write a book. And I would literally like laugh her off. Like I didn't take her seriously. And I don't know, after a couple of few years, I, I just thought about it and decided, well, maybe, maybe she's right. I have some, some lessons and some, you know, truth and maybe some inspiration that I can share. And so I, reached out to a literary agent and that's the way that most um, published authors go about it and I found out um, that I needed one so I reached out to this 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 one um, agent at transatlantic agency and how I found them is because I seen that they represented a couple of uh, people that I knew uh, in the industry and that were native they loved my book idea they helped me um, organized chapter outlines and I wrote I think three or four sample chapters and I had all of the outlines done and then they shopped it around and I had some meetings with the, some publishers and then I decided to go with House of a Nancy. I just knew in my gut that I needed to go with them. They were so um, genuine 
and so enthusiastic about my book. And I just knew that they would treat it with care and love. And I did. And then from there, they paired me with an, an editor. I finished writing the book within a few months. And we really pushed it because I think I signed with them in, in April of 20. I can't. Yeah, not last year, but the year before of 2021, April. I said, no, yeah, around June. And then we had the book done by October and the, and the final edit's done by December. And then it came out that next July. So it was a pretty quick yeah. process. But I kind of like, I kind of, things flowed, flowed pretty easy for me because I was ready. It was yeah. like, it, it was there and it needed to come and, and it did come. So, so that's a little bit about how that worked. Amazing. Okay. Um, Someone is wondering uh, where you will be visiting, and they're wondering specifically Ontario and when. Oh, you know what? Interesting. So I'm going actually to Ontario, but it's only for like um, a day and a night. I'm going October 17th, I think. I I just found out, and I'm 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 being asked to speak at an event there. It's at the this casino in Barrie, Ontario um okay. uh, wait no may am i saying october yeah the 17th of may i'm going but it's i'm only going for that night and day um but who knows because you know i've i've been to uh, toronto a lot in the past year and a half so i could be going there uh again soon you never know all right um what would you most like mainstream white folks to understand that we don't yet? Oh, gosh. Oh, boy. I think... I think if they understood the seriousness of um, the history of this country that that this country is literally founded on genocide of indigenous peoples. And I don't blame them for not knowing because we weren't taught these things. This, this history was purposely uh, kept from us, hidden from us. But now we are in this era of truth. Now, you know, the graves of our children are being, you know, being unearthed. And um, if they just really understood the, um, the consequences of that and how that plays out today and the intergenerational trauma that it has caused that that would give them maybe some compassion towards this healing, this truth and this reconciliation process. How has your brave book affected your children? Oh, they are amazing. Um, like my oldest is 24. Faith is 24. Luke will be 23 in a couple of weeks. Danny will be 19 in June. And then Alasia, my youngest, she'll be five in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and my oldest, they all read it. They all knew about the book. Um, they're very supportive. They're encouraged. I mean, they don't, they don't really care. <laughs> like they read the book and they think it's cool, but you know, I'm just their mom <laughs> and stuff, but they're, you know, they're really amazing kids. So they're, they're good. We've come through a lot and I'm just really blessed that um, all my kids are actually doing so well. So. Cool. Amazing. Um, so this person is asking a personal question for their own interest. It's not a challenge. Um, she's really curious about your Iroquois ancestry as we come from the same area, Treaty 6. Mm -hmm. My ancestor's name is 
Testowich. My great great grandfather was brother to Duncan Testowich of Duncan's First Nation Treaty Six. Some sources have said that the name would imply Iroquois ancestry as it ends with witch spelled many different ways. Just got excited when I saw your bio and saw Iroquois in there. Was also curious as to why you didn't don't identify as Métis. Thank you for your time and your courage as you push through personal and professional challenges every day. Cool. So um, <clears throat> my ancestors, my Iroquois ancestors are from uh, Ganawage in Quebec, uh, in so-called Quebec. So um, my great, one of my great grandfathers, my great grandfather times five uh, came over from Ganawage and he came and intermarried with the Crees here and followed really a legacy here in Alberta. And even though it's five generations back for Iroquois side, um, you know, he was a very influential leader and um, uh, they called him the sun traveler. And I, I actually had the opportunity to go and visit Guanajuato for the first time last summer, met with an elder there um, and, uh, you know, told told me like, you you are a part of us. It was very, very beautiful. And so, yeah, and so my Cookham and my, and my mom, they're Cree. Um, my dad is French. I used to identify as like Métis, but I prefer more like mixed blood or identifying, you know, with my nation. So as Cree, Iroquois or French, because I think the Métis label um, can be um, misconstrued, like just there's a lot of different ways that that can be interpreted. And I also come from the Michelle First Nation, which is a nation that was corruptly enfranchised um, in the 1950s uh, by the Canadian government. And our band has been, you know, our people are scattered uh, all over the place here, but our, our band has been in talks with the federal government for several years to get uh, recognition again. And I actually qualify for treaty status. I just haven't ever done that yet. So it's kind of a complicated mixed um, answer, but yeah. Right, well, um, I think we'll wrap things up. So I wanna say that um, this has been a, a dream come true, Brandy. Uh, um. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've um, been raising awareness about um, missing Indigenous women since I was a, a teenager. Oh. And um, really? yeah, how when, you, when, like, when, how when I found get... out about, yeah, that this was happening in, in um, Canada, um, you know, that wow. women my age were, were, were going missing. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, so powerful to, um, he uh, hear your story and, and host you, um, here this evening. Um, I, you're, you know, so inspiring to, um, so many, uh, here and around the world. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, which is a thank you in Hokuminum. And uh, we have sent you a gift uh, along with an honorarium. So we want everyone to know that um, Vancouver Island Regional Library truly values your time and for sharing with us this this evening. Uh, it's been so, so powerful and, and moving. Uh, and um, to everyone joining us, uh, thank you so much for tuning in and um, please visit our website to learn more about uh, Red Dress Day and MMIWG resources and support at virl.bc.ca. Uh, the recording of this uh, author talk will be available on May 5th, Red Dress Day. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, as well. And if you'd like uh, to give some feedback, uh, just reply to the email that you were sent the Zoom link. I uh, would, would love to um, hear from you and uh, encourage you to uh, let us know uh, uh, so that we can uh, continue to offer amazing um, Indigenous women authors like, like Brandy. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Thank you so much, Delia. This is like beyond like, <laughs> so this is so encouraging. And I'm happy that I've been able to, um, you know, offer inspiration um, and encouragement because this work isn't always easy. So this actually yeah. helps a lot. And just thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you to everybody that came, please. Um, you know, take this knowledge back to your own um, houses and your own communities and, and, and say prayers and, and use your heart to help, um, you know, end this violence. And, and I'm just very grateful. Hi, hi, everybody. Thank you.